meeting is being recorded. Great. All right. Um, welcome to From the Experts, everyone. My name is Samira. I am the founder and executive director of the Samira Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to raising awareness of both NMO and MOG. We fundraise to support research, patient advocacy, and are very passionate about building communities of support for patients and their caregivers. Today, um, you are here as part of our From the Experts webinar series, a program sponsored by Horizon Therapeutics and something that I feel is very special to our community in that we have the chance to ask questions directly about very relevant topics to experts such as the expert I am very excited to introduce all of you to. Today we have Dr. Robert Shen from Georgetown University. He is a neurologist, an MS, NMO, and MOG expert, and today he will be talking about revisiting the clinically isolated syndrome. This is a topic that I am particularly interested in as eight years into this journey, I still continue to test negative for both NMO and MOG, so I will be listening very intently. Just a couple of housekeeping um, items. This, this session, as you know, is being recorded and um, the webinar will be available for replay both on TSF's YouTube and Facebook libraries. So you will be able to access this um, when you need to in the future. We will have a dedicated section of the webinar for questions and answers to Dr. Shin. Um, so please hold your questions for the first 30 minutes um, so that you can pay attention to Dr. Shin's presentation and then he will answer as many as he can. Thank you again for being here and I now in, am very honored to introduce you to Dr. Robert Schiff. Thank you so much, Samara. You know, we uh, met relatively recently and I was really so impressed with your mission and your enthusiasm. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thanks to those of you who are joining live. I appreciate that. It's, uh, I hope we can make this kind of an intimate conversation and uh, that you'll feel free to ask questions. As Samara mentioned, I'm Bob Shin. I'm a neurologist and neuro-ophthalmologist actually at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, DC. And I direct the MS and Neuroimmunology Center here. So uh, we take care of a lot of uh, individuals uh, who might have a variety of these neuroimmunologic conditions, including NMO spectrum disorder, of course. And the topic I wanted to talk about is this concept of a clinically isolated syndrome. Um, and I'll be honest, we mostly started to talk about clinically isolated syndrome in the context of multiple sclerosis, which in, in the United States and, and in Europe is, is more common than NMO spectrum disorder. But I think uh, the concept is something that's going to be very important regardless of what condition we're talking about. Uh, and I was going to actually show slides. And in fact, I, I show some of these slides to healthcare providers as well. Um, but I'll try to make sure that we're uh, not um, being over technical here. So Samara, I don't know if you're still on it. Are you able to allow me to share my screen? Absolutely. Or, Let me make yeah. you the host. I'll have the power to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There you go. All right. So let me see if I can get the uh, screen up. All right, is this visible to everyone? Yes. All right, so again, uh, this is a set of slides that I do present also to physicians in training or to colleagues, uh, but I think that it's certainly something we can uh, work through here. And, and I, I kind of base this around cases that I, people that I've actually evaluated. Um, and so this, I guess, typical case is a young woman who's a yoga instructor, and she, you know, I have these doctor abbreviations, but she lost vision in her right eye. Um, the right eye had this kind of pokey, achy sensation behind her eye, and she had blurred vision. And you, you know, we rate vision, 20-20 uh, would be average vision, and her vision in her right eye was 2070, which is pretty blurry. You really couldn't drive with 2070 vision. Uh, the vision in her left eye was actually better than 2020, it was 2015. Uh, the other thing we often do in the office is do things like check your ability to see color. What's very interesting about demyelinating diseases, when it affects vision, it often prevents you from seeing color clearly or it will make colors faded. And she did have uh, poor color vision in her right eye. Uh, 
And if you've been to the doctor and they, you know, shine a flashlight in one eye and swing it back and forth, she had what we call an afferent pupillary defect. So I'm examining her and I'm saying, wow, we have decreased vision in the right eye. She's reporting it aches. It's a little bit uncomfortable. She doesn't see color very well in that eye. And, and when I'm checking her pupils, I can see there's less reaction when light is in that right eye. So um, I immediately sent her for a test. And I think many of you on this call may have had MRIs. This is a uh, an example of an MRI, it's a horizontal slice through the head. If I, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, basically it's a cross section. And, you know, when we go into magnets, we're lying on our back. So actually her forehead is up at the top of the screen. And then um, the back of her head is down at the bottom of the screen. And it's a picture of the brain in real time. And as you may know, our brains are cut in half down the middle. We have a right brain and a left brain. And the surface of the brain has these folds or wrinkles, which you can kind of see on the surface of the brain. She had these spots, these white spots within her brain, areas of inflammation or demyelination. And so here's this young woman with this vision loss in her right eye. She does have some spots on her MRI. And you know, when I ask other medical people, well, what do we think is going on? Um, usually, to be honest, it's really not a difficult diagnosis. Um, people recognize that this is optic neuritis. In other words, this is inflammation of the optic nerve. She has decreased vision, decreased color vision, and this pupil abnormality, which is why we uh, doctors love to take flashlights and shine them in your eyes all of the time. So uh, the diagnosis of optic neuritis was not difficult, but really some of the question becomes, well, what's causing the optic neuritis? And as I kind of hinted, a lot of what we think of when we think about optic neuritis was based on our understanding of multiple sclerosis, which again, in the United States uh, is more common than some of the other neuroimmunologic disorders. One thing that was recognized decades ago was that there could be a connection between optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis. So that we, we definitely recognized a long time ago. In fact, uh, one thing we had observed is that maybe half of people who show up with optic neuritis have spots on their MRI. And we also noticed that about half of people who showed up with optic neuritis, about 50%, eventually get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So there's this sort of idea, this recognition that the brain MRI, when somebody shows up with something like optic neuritis, the brain MRI might help predict the risk of developing MS into the future. So uh, this person um, really, illustrate someone showing up with a single episode, um, especially back in, let's say, the 1990s. Uh, we didn't really talk about a single episode as being multiple sclerosis, right? The word multiple, multiple sclerosis is usually multiple episodes. So if somebody shows up with one episode, you're like, well, that's not really multiple anything. And so we had to come up with a different term. We started talking about a clinically isolated syndrome, meaning it certainly looks, sounds, smells like demyelinating inflammation, but it's only been a single episode. It's isolated. Um, and so a lot of different studies were done. I'm not going to go into detail, but we had different names for them, ETOMS, CHAMPS, Benefit Precise, looking at, well, if we identify someone with a single episode of, let's say, optic neuritis, and if their brain MRI has spots on it, and we therefore believe that they're at high risk for multiple sclerosis, how do they do if we give them multiple sclerosis medicine? And we actually showed that actually for large numbers of patients, if you show up with a single episode and you have an abnormal brain MRI, the risk of MS is significant enough that you might benefit by being treated with multiple sclerosis therapies. And it's really not the purpose of this talk or maybe for this audience, but you may know that from the multiple sclerosis side, since the early 1990s, we've had an increasing number of therapies for MS. So this was actually a very important question or concern. So the idea of treating a clinically isolated syndrome with multiple sclerosis medicines really started to take hold in our field. Um, we certainly noticed that we could prevent maybe conversion to clinically definite MS, or at least delay that next episode before you would be called multiple sclerosis. And it really seemed like our MS medicines were reducing MS attacks and preventing MRI lesions. And so this sort of became our standard approach. If somebody showed up and they had an episode of optic neuritis, and maybe they had some abnormalities on their MRI, we might consider 
diagnosing them with clinically isolated syndrome, which we believed would be a basically someone at risk of MS, and we would consider using MS medications to treat that individual. Um, and that really brings us up into, uh, honestly, into the early 2000s. That, that just, that's really how I was trained, and, and that's really how the field behaved, if you will. Um, but I do want to present another example, um, and this is another young individual. This was a 22-year-old nursing student, kind of a similar story, developed blurred vision in her right eye. And she remembers when she would look down, she could feel this little aching behind her eye. And she had that afferent pupillary defect. It's really just very similar to the yoga student I just mentioned. Um, she saw an eye doctor who looked in the eye, didn't see anything abnormal, but kind of made the diagnosis, said this looks like optic neuritis. This individual who was a nursing student was told, you know, you might have multiple sclerosis, but I don't think you're going to be able to cut it as a nursing student. Maybe you should just go, you know, get married, settle down and just try to have a good life. Because what I didn't tell you about this 22 year old is that she was being diagnosed in the late 1960s. So her episode of optic neuritis happened in 1967 when she was a nursing student and she actually did drop out of nursing school um, at that time, uh, but went on to actually have a very happy marriage and successful children. Um, but her history of relapse emitting MS really goes back decades to this optic neuritis of she had a clinically isolated syndrome in 1967. She actually went on to have other episodes. For instance, she developed left-sided weakness and actually numbness on the right side of her body. So she had other neurological symptoms. And in the 1970s, uh, she had several attacks uh, and I'll be honest, I have no idea how old anyone is on this call, but maybe some people would be familiar with treatment with ACTH back in the day. That's how we might try to treat inflammation. Thankfully, after that um, flurry of activity in the 1970s, she actually quieted down and she was actually stable for 20 years, raised her family. Actually, she had a, um, a son who went on to medical school himself. And so uh, she was doing very well. But in the 1990s, she had another flurry of attacks. And um, again, some of you may know that in the MS world, although MS was really not treatable uh, until the early 1990s, there were treatments available for MS when she had this second, if you will, flurry of attacks in the 1990s. So in 1997, 99, um, she had these episodes and actually she was put on one of the MS therapies. She was put on beta interferon. And she again, quieted down, she stabilized. So it's sort of like, well, this is great. And which is when I come into the picture because I inherited her as a patient of mine. Her provider was an older provider who was retiring. And so I inherited this individual who had at that point a 30 year history of multiple sclerosis. She was on an MS disease modifying therapy and she was stable. So I was like, okay, well, this is easy. I can keep an eye on her. I hope I, you know, I hope I don't mess this up, but then she showed up in our emergency room in 2005, and she had suddenly become unable to walk and had no control of her bladder. So she had lost control of her bladder. Um, I, I have had my, my career has been in an, ac an academic medical center. So I had a call in the middle of the night from our residents, the resident physicians in the hospital saying, Dr. Shin, uh, your patient is in the hospital. And I said, I don't know what happened. They said, well, she can't walk and she's lost control of her bladder. We're very concerned about her. I said, oh my gosh, uh, well, how does the MRI look? I said, Dr. Shen, that's what we're most concerned about. I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I wonder what, what they're talking about. So they showed me her brain MRI, all right? So at this time, the young woman with optic neuritis with a clinically isolated syndrome in 1967 is now a 60 year old woman with multiple sclerosis on treatment. And this is her brain MRI. These um, are a series of axial sections or cross sections. And uh, again, you can kind of see that you have two hemispheres of the brain. You can see that actually there are fluid spaces within the brain that we call ventricles. So these are just different slices from going uh, top, uh, moving down into her brain. And actually this slice is low enough to get her eyeball. So these circles are her eyeballs and the bridge of her nose is here in the middle. Uh, her ears are on the side of her head. But what I want to show you is this 60 year old with a 30 year history of more, has no abnormalities on her brain MRI. This is a completely normal brain MRI. 
And yet she's had this history of multiple sclerosis for decades, along with a flurry of attacks in the 1990s. And then it's, it's very puzzling. And she's here in the hospital, unable to walk with no control of her bladder. And of course, it was on her spinal cord imaging that we saw this longitudinally extensive area of demyelination. So this is a side view. This is her head up at the top of the page. She's looking off to the left. Um, her face is a little bit cut off. These are her lips and her chin. Um, her head is up here. This is her neck and her chest at the bottom of the screen. These squares are the bones, are basically her backbone, her spine, and the spine surrounds the spinal cord. And um, uh, on this MRI sequence, the spinal cord tissue should be dark gray. And I think you can see this patchy white area of inflammation. And it goes from very high up in her neck all the way down into her chest. Um, and this is um, now moving down. Now this is still a side view, but this is just her chest. So her lungs and her heart, her organs are here, but you can see her backbone running down her back and the spinal cord inflammation that we saw up in her neck continues all the way down into her mid back. And if any of you have had an MRI, you know that just after all the beeping and banging, you think you're done, but they pull you out and then someone comes in and injects you with gadolinium contrast agent and then puts you back in the magnet. The reason for that is to see if there's active inflammation. And in fact, that entire area of demyelination in her spinal cord was lighting up. It was active enhancement. Now, I kind of mentioned, even though her story went back to 1967, this presentation was in 2005. And something, uh, I don't know if that year means anything to you, but something had just come out in the literature. The scientists at the Mayo Clinic had identified an mm -hmm. antibody that some people have in their blood called aquaporin-4. And it was the first report that aquaporin-4 antibodies were associated with uh, something that we call neuromyelitis optica. We now call neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. And we had literally just read this article in The Lancet, which is uh, where it had just come out. And so we said, this case is not multiple sclerosis. And we sent her blood to the Mayo Clinic and she had aquaporin for antibodies in her blood. And so we corrected her diagnosis after 30 some years to neuromyelitis optica. And she was treated with, as I think many of you know, we use um, corticosteroids, you might use plasma exchange. Um, it, at this time in the early 2000s, we were using oral immunosuppressant medications to try to control her. And thankfully she eventually stabilized and actually has done well. I, I actually, um, although we've moved institutions, uh, we, we actually um, occasionally have contact and she remains, uh, continues to do well. But I highlighted this case because this is someone who presented with an optic neuritis, a clinically isolated syndrome, was even given a multiple sclerosis diagnosis for years, actually for decades. Uh, and it wasn't until much later that we actually correctly identified her as having neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. And I know that um, this audience has listened to many of the Samara Foundation videos and have learned that there is a spectrum of symptoms that can be associated with neuromyelitis optic. Optic neuritis, of course, transverse myelitis, of course. Uh, many of you have heard of area postrema syndrome, inflammation in the brainstem causing unexplained hiccups, nausea, or vomiting. This still happens and it's still a mystery sometimes because people are evaluated by gastroenterologists who can't find anything wrong, but it's because of inflammation in the brainstem. And I think as many of you know, not all, as Samara mentioned, but many patients with NMO spectrum disorders do in fact have antibodies to aquaporin-4 uh, in the blood. All right, well, um, I wanted to highlight one more case if we have time for this. Um, and this is someone, I, uh, I myself actually am Asian or Korean, and, and I'll be honest, there's not a lot of multiple sclerosis in East Asia. Um, this was a patient that I saw here in Washington, DC. It's a, it's a fairly uh, cosmopolitan city. Uh, and she was herself a Korean with, um, who owned a restaurant. And you know, I don't want to upset anybody on this call, but I, I, I'm going to tell you guys a secret, which is that most Japanese restaurants that you go to are not in the United States are not owned by Japanese people. A lot of Japanese restaurants are run by Korean and Chinese uh, people who uh, kind of cashed in on America's love of sushi. So this patient of mine is Korean but she owns a Japanese restaurant. She developed blurred vision in her right. This is exactly just like 
The other two individuals I mentioned, she lost vision in her right eye. Actually, she did not go to see a healthcare provider because she needed to run her restaurant. And it was her children who begged her. They said, mom, you're not able to see out of your right eye. You need to go see a doctor. And so she finally came for evaluation. She had lost vision in her right eye uh, and complained of some pressure behind that eye and a little bit of, again, very similar story. Her vision was terrible. Uh, and again, I, I doctor, I guess, terminology on here, but her vision, the visual acuity, the VA was LP, which means light percent. All she could see was light and dark. That's how bad the vision had gotten in her right eye. Her left eye was still 20-20 and normal. She had a whopping afferent pupillary defect. When I sh was shining light in her right eye versus the left eye, there was a tremendous difference. Uh, but again, the back of her eye looked pretty unremarkable. When she had her MRI, and again, this is a cross-section, uh, axial section, we say, and imagine her lying on her back, and I'm doing a cross-section, and these circles are her eyeballs. This is an image right through her eyeballs, and this is the bridge of her nose. You can see the brain behind her eyeballs here. And in fact, you can even see these lines, these cables, excuse me, uh, these lines are her optic nerves, the cable that connects the eyeball to the brain so that you can see. And I think you can get a sense of, you can see here, there's an R for right side and L for left side. This is her right optic nerve. And you can see, I think that it's much brighter than her left optic nerves because her right optic nerve is very inflamed. In fact, the entire nerve is inflamed. It's not just part of the nerve, the whole nerve is inflamed. If I looked at it differently, let's say I looked at it, we call this a coronal section. It's a little bit creepy, but imagine somebody looking, looking right at you, like you're looking at this person in their eye. So this would be their right, orbit where the right eyeball would be. And this is the left orbit where their left eyeball. Again, you can see the front of their brain because this is their forehead. But, um, oh, by the way, these are your sinuses, you know, behind your nose when you, you know, I've, my sinuses are stuffed up. These are the air passages behind your nose. So again, this is a kind of detail we get on MRI. But again, I think you can appreciate that the right optic nerve, the eye that can only see light and dark is very bright compared to the left optic nerve, which is more of a normal gray color that we would expect. And one more MRI I'm going to show you. Again, remember, you get the MRI. Halfway through, they pull you out. They inject you with contrast. And then they put you back in for another set of pictures. This is showing that that optic nerve is leaking gadolinium. It is enhancing. It is very active. In fact, not just the optic nerve, but the tissues around the optic nerve are inflamed as well. And again, compare that to the left optic nerve, which just has a normal appearance. So here is a middle-aged Korean woman suddenly lost vision in her right. She has a clinically isolated syndrome with inflammation of her optic nerve. We immediately treated her with high dose steroids. In this case, I was using actually high dose oral steroids, but the point being that I gave her very high dose steroids and her, the pain went away and her vision began to improve very quickly. In fact, she went from only being able to see light and dark to being able to see 2050 which is, again, her left eye was 20-20, but the right eye was much improved. The pupil abnormality was a little bit better. She even started to be able to see some of the color plates. I usually use these, you may have seen these little colored dot plates with numbers hidden in them. Her left eye could see all 10 of the numbers. Her right eye could see two and a half of the numbers. So it was beginning to get back, but it was improving after high dose oral steroids. Of course, we checked for aquaporin-4 antibodies. She actually did not have those. She was aquaporin for antibody negative, but what she did have was antibodies to something different, which is called MOG, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, an antibody that we only just learned about a few years ago. And so we were able to diagnose her not with multiple sclerosis, not with neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, but with something we now call MOGAD or MOG antibody associated disorder. And again, there's quite a bit of overlap in these conditions because optic neuritis, all three of my cases had optic neuritis, transverse myelitis can occur. Um, you may have heard of children having demyelinating disease. Sometimes this happens after things like vaccines and things like that, or viral infections. And there's a phenomenon that we call acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or ADEM can occur in adults as well, but more common in children. Turns out a lot of that we now recognize is associated with MOG antibodies. But there is a tremendous amount of overlap with NMO spectrum disorder, but it's associated with a different antibody. So think about 
the history of our following people with inflammatory disorders, where at one time we kind of thought everything was just MS or subtypes of MS. In 2005, we realized, wait a minute, there's actually a distinct condition, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, often associated with antibodies to aquaporin. About five years ago, so roughly 2015, we were like, wait a minute, there's yet another disorder. There's another antibody that we didn't know about, but now we know about MOG antibodies, MOG antibodies. So, you know, I might predict that in the future, we're going to discover that there are yet other antibodies that have yet to be discovered that may create a similar kind of a picture. But where I really wanted to close today is to say that this concept of clinically isolated syndrome that really began in the 90s when we we're talking about MS um, really has to be revisited. Because if somebody presents with optic neuritis today in 2022, I actually have to be thinking that this clinically isolated syndrome might be one of multiple possibilities. Sometimes I have to be honest and say it's still idiopathic. That's our doctor term for saying we don't actually have a good explanation for it. It just happened on its own as far as we could tell. And true, it sometimes can be multiple sclerosis. Again, something that we've been focusing on a lot since the 1990s. But we have to recognize that it may also be neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or now we have to also factor in the possibility, possibility of a MOG antibody associated disorder or MOGAD. And so what I would like to kind of highlight is that it is very important for us to sort these things out because we have the wonderful problem of having a lot of different treatment options. So it's great to have these treatment options, but they're all very different. So obviously if it's just isolated idiopathic optic neuritis, we usually actually don't treat that. But if you have multiple sclerosis, there's a variety of MS treatment options available for that. And I think this audience knows that we're very fortunate now that there are three FDA approved therapies for neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder now. And I'm sure that you've had presentations on those options. I have to tell you that MOG is, is a newly recognized entity. So it's not crystal clear the best way to treat it. There are technically no FDA approved treatments for it specifically, but people do use different uh, types of medications for it. But I think if you look at these lists, you're like, oh wait, but it's all different. The medicines we use for MS may not help people, may even worsen NMO. The medicines that we use for NMO, it's not clear that they would be useful for MOG. Um, so it is, again, very important for us to learn how to sort them out. And I'm just going to summarize this by saying that my approach to the clinically isolated syndrome or optic neuritis in 2022 has evolved. They are absolutely, I'm absolutely going to order a brain MRI, but I'm also going to consider imaging the orbit specifically, as well as the spinal cord, because again, I need to be thinking about the possibility of these other conditions. And you may have had a presentation on this, but it is so important that we get the word out that providers, physicians, nurses, generalists, specialists need to know that it is very important for us to check for antibodies, to aquaporin for, and I'm going to argue also for MOG, kind of might as well check for both at the same time so that we can figure out if somebody has antibody positive NMO spectrum disorder or antibody positive MOG because it is, it is going to impact how we manage those patients. All right. So those are really the slides that I wanted to present, uh, the topic I wanted to present, which is this concept of the clinically isolated syndrome and how it has really changed over time um, and how it really behooves us to not, not just you and, and everybody that you're networking with, but healthcare providers, how important it is for us to spread the word that when someone presents with an initial demyelinating event, whether it's optic neuritis or transverse myelitis or a brainstem event, even if they're unusual brain MRI lesions, we need to be thinking about checking for aquaporin for antibodies and MOG antibodies so that we can get this diagnosis correct from the beginning. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening to my presentation. Uh, I am absolutely happy to stay and answer any questions that you might have. Yes, now would be the time to populate your questions into the chat function or the Q&A function, but definitely take advantage of the fact that Dr. Shin is here and ready and able and willing to answer your questions. Don't be shy. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Just give people a couple of minutes. I have a question for you, actually. We'll just get things started. Yeah. 
Um, I'll take myself as an example. As I said, it's been eight years and I continue to test negative for both NMO and MOG and MS is no longer in the equation. Do you see patients like this who end up testing positive for something years and years later? Well, the story I think is still being written. Um, for example, I, I kind of gave an example of someone who had, if you will, the wrong diagnosis or an incorrect diagnosis literally for decades before the Aquaporn 4 antibodies were known about, right? And then we can yeah. correct that. And I have to tell you that over the past, let's say 15 years or so, I had many patients with neuromyosophagus spectrum disorder who did not have aquaporin for antibodies. And, you know, we just, a separate conversation would be that we actually have diagnostic criteria for that. You can be diagnosed with NMO spectrum disorder on the basis of other clinical features, even if you don't have antibodies. But I have recently discovered at least some of them turn out to have MOG antibodies because again, they didn't exist in the early 2000s, or we didn't know about them in the early 2000s, or even into the early 20, 2010s. So um, I guess what I've learned is to say that, hey, we don't know everything, and there are things yet to be discovered. Um, but I think we should also recognize, and this is another separate conversation, that the tests are not perfect either. Um, and even if you've tested many times, um, sometimes uh, it remains negative until some future date. You know, I've, I've had patients who did not have, let's say, aquaporin for antibodies until I tested them five times, which, which sounds kind of crazy, but, um, you know, we just um, were persistent and eventually it was positive. Um, I've shared patients with other specialists who perhaps were skeptical, you know, maybe I thought it might be NMO spectrum disorder. They weren't so sure. And, you know, there were no antibodies. And then later on, a test did come back positive, for example, you see. So um, I don't um, feel that uh, someone who's persistently negative, um, I guess what I would say is I still work with it as either NMO spectrum or whatever that it clinically fits into. Um, and, but I keep in mind in my head, that there is more to be learned, you know, more to be understood. And I, and, you know, perhaps in the future, we'll have a different answer. So. And just a quick follow up to that, and I do see some people are asking questions, which I'm excited about. Um, what percentage of the NMOSD MOG AD patient population would you say are like me, where they're double seronegative? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know if I have the most up to date, best numbers. I think I would say it's probably less than 10%, but you know, if you have 100 people, that's like 10 people. <laughs> like yeah. There's always going to be a decent number of people in that category. And so maybe in MS, I'll be honest, we're used to a little bit of uncertainty, right? Um, you know, things aren't always handed to us on a platter, um, but, um, but it's okay. Again, we, we recognize that this is the case. And I actually do have a number of my own patients that I follow that I have, I'll be honest, I've tested several times and they remain negative, where I still am quite convinced that they have NMO spectrum disorder. Again, there may be something, an antibody I'm not aware of yet, you know, that accounts oh, for it. But for now, I still work with them as NMO spectrum disorder because, you know, that's what they fit best. Yeah, double negative is interesting. At least I can share from a patient perspective. I mean, while I very much identify with NMO, because I tend to test negative, like every 18 months we check and I'm like, eight years in, I'm like, do I have this? It makes you kind of wonder like, what's actually going on here? So I think there's a little bit of an identity crisis and it definitely makes getting therapies approved so much harder because insurance requires that you test positive for X, Y, or Z in order to get approved for a therapy. So I'm sure a lot of people on the call who are seronegative on um, both can agree, but it's, defi it's definitely a little bit challenging um, to internalize when you're like, well, I'm not testing positive for anything. So what is this? Well, it's so interesting because maybe this is a weird paradox that when we knew less, in a way, it would be less anxiety provoking because we used to just be like, yeah, yeah, this clinical picture we call NMO. We actually debated. We thought NMO spectrum was just part of MS. It was just a type of MS. Yeah. Um, we didn't know about antibodies, so it was just fine. Um, we talked about Asian MS or optico-spinal MS. It was just a type of MS. And then, um, you know, I'll be honest, we didn't have any FDA-approved therapies for NMO 
we don't have any from Agda the state. So we really just did the best we could with different types of agents. So it wasn't important if you were antibody positive or negative. You know, it wasn't important exactly what the label was. We just sort of addressed each person individually. So it is a funny paradox that we now, oh, it's great that we have these advances in treatment. Oh, it's great that we're learning science. Typically, we're learning more about different autoantibodies that can have these effects. But as you're saying, it's so new that we're really stumbling and struggling with how to integrate this information with care decisions, you know? Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's bittersweet because I'm like, well, it's good because we're learning more and we have more options. But, you know, it's bad if you, you know, find yourself sort of, you know, uh, I don't know, like, uh, as you said, having an identity crisis because of essentially these um, labels, you know, and I, I, I would say I, I, we need, we need to, uh, we need to erase that from you so you don't have to feel <laughs> that way. <laughs> totally. Okay, so I will let you go ahead and answer the questions. Um, they are in the Q&A function. All right, well, I'm seeing some questions here. Um, one question was whether there's any new information that would indicate that an initial attack would be the only attack, like could it be truly monophasic? How would you determine that? And um, that is a fantastic question because let's say someone has a single event, I guess one possibility would be that, well, maybe it'll be really lucky, maybe it'll be one time only, you know, but maybe it could be the first of other events. And so again, this is why it is so important for us to check for antibodies. Because one thing I could say is if we check and I find aquaporin for antibodies, or I find even MOG antibodies, I'm definitely going to be more vigilant or more um, uh, cautious because I'm going to be worried about an additional attack Occurring. I would say for antibody positive NMO spectrum disorder, this is this is my personal opinion. I'm absolutely going to get that person on therapy because NMO spectrum disorder, when antibodies are positive, I'm going to say almost always eventually results in another episode. So I definitely want to prevent that. I will say um, that there can be subtleties. If somebody has MOG antibody associated disorder and it's a single event and I find nothing else abnormal on their MRI. Um, there are times when I would just maybe follow that a little bit to see what happens, because sometimes it just could be a one-time fluke. Um, on the multiple sclerosis side, um, there is evidence that says that somebody with a single event who has abnormal spots on their MRI, if you follow them long enough, 80, 90% of the time, they're going to have that second event. And that was all of that um, clinical trial data I sort of glossed over that he suggested that an MS clinically isolated syndrome um, often probably should be treated. Um, so I'm sort of answering your question in reverse. If somebody had a single episode of optic neuritis, uh, there was no antibody positivity, there was actually nothing else abnormal on the brain or spinal cord MRI. It was a truly isolated optic neuritis, let's say. Um, I might choose to be uh, just recommend surveillance, which might mean follow-up MRI over time before we commit to a kind of a therapy. Um, but, you know, as I was just telling, you know, Samara, like there's, a, we have to learn to live with a little bit of uncertainty and, you know, try to, you know, basically do our best for the individual. Um, there was another question about the best treatment for double negative NMOSD. And um, in this case, I would say, uh, you know, I would disclose that um, there are no FDA therapies that have been approved specifically for someone who is antibody negative. It was easier to say, well, if you're antibody positive, the clinical trial data supports use of, you know, this therapy or that therapy. Um, my personal opinion, it's still going to depend on the individual, as I was saying just a second ago. Um, even if somebody is antibody negative based on their clinical picture, we're definitely going to have a conversation about what we can do to prevent future episodes. So um, uh, again, I, I almost am unable to give a, this is the best treatment, um, but different individuals will use different kinds of therapy. And there are things that you'd probably be, feel, be familiar with. Some people have used oral immunosuppressants. Some people use B-cell therapies. Um, again, these are all things that I think this audience would be familiar with. Um, there's a question about what if aquaporin-4 antibodies are present in the spinal fluid um, but not in, I guess, presumably in the serum. And, and so uh, usually we send, we draw blood and we send that um, to get a positive test. You could, because many people in their workup when it's not clear what's going on, might even get a spinal tap, you know, a needle in the back and collect some spinal fluid. And uh, you may detect antibodies in the spinal fluid. 
Um, and I think the question is saying, but what if there's a mismatch? What if you found them in the spinal fluid, but we didn't actually find them in the blood? I'm going to say that my personal opinion of the scenario is if you get a positive, it's positive. You know, I usually, I usually will um, um, make the assumption this is antibody positive NMO spectrum disorder, um, because it's really more the other way. Sometimes people I think have NMO, but I couldn't detect the antibodies. It, it didn't show up every time. So, but if I did a spinal fluid test and I did find antibodies, um, especially if you think about these are antibodies that are circulating uh, around the brain and spinal cord, um, you know, I'm going to treat that as a positive. So I don't, I don't, um, I would not discount it because it was in the spinal fluid. All right. Uh, and then one more question. Uh, this is sort of a personal question of this individual, which again, you know, I'm not really qualified to make a very um, specific comment on someone who's not my patient, so I, I don't know all of the details. But I think what the story would be a situation where somebody has had clinical episodes, at least two different clinical episodes, but the imaging maybe hasn't shown any abnormalities um, and there haven't been other antibody tests. And so then the question would be, well, what if you're in that scenario where um, maybe the good thing is that a lot of time has passed and thankfully there doesn't appear to be classic inflammation or lesions on the MRI and uh, there, are no, there are no antibody um, antibodies that are positive. Um, could you consider surveillance? Um, and maybe as I already hinted, that is something that I might consider doing, right? If somebody has a situation that thankfully appears to be, whether it's very mild or maybe a variation that we're not as familiar with, um, I, I, I believe that MRI can be a very sensitive measure, a sensitive way to keep an eye out for inflammation. Now, um, uh, I'm sorry to kind of keep talking about multiple sclerosis, but again, in the US, we're a little bit, we have more experience with it because it's more common. And you should know that for people living with multiple sclerosis, they can have up to 10 spots show up on an MRI for every one symptom they experience. And there is actually some evidence that people with neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder may also have changes on MRI, even in the absence of neurological symptoms. I, I don't think it's as common as it is in MS, but that can be the case. So I feel like MRI is a, it's a non-invasive tool. Um, actually, you, you should be aware, um, MRIs don't use radiation. So it's different from an X-ray or a CAT scan. I, I'm not saying you should do this, but you can get like an MRI every week and it would be, you know, as far as we know, it would not cause any health concerns. So I think an MRI at maybe an every six month interval, maybe a once a year interval would be a great way to keep our eye out to see if anything is changing. Uh, and I think that would give us enough time to take action if, if that needed to occur. Okay, I have one final question for you, Dr. Shin. Um, right. As you probably know, one of the biggest challenges for rare disease patients, um, NMO, MOG, et cetera, I mean, there are 7,000 rare diseases, is finding a specialist who truly understands and knows how to treat your illness. And I hear this from our community so much that their local neurologist, you know, doesn't necessarily, isn't maybe the best fit to treat a patient sometimes. So my question to you is, are you accepting new patients? And do you, you know, do you conduct teleneurology for some of our out of state patients looking for a great doctor? Well, uh, I do accept new patients. I, and I should emphasize, we have a center, you know, the Georgetown MS and Neuroimmunology Center uh, is actually pretty large. We have eight clinicians that focus on neuroimmunologic conditions. You've had Dr. Osborne on, on your um, program and, and uh, giving a conversation there. Uh, we're fortunate, you know, in the Metro DC area, Maryland, DC and Virginia to have a lot of expertise, a lot of specialists who are focused on this. Um, to your point, and I'm really glad you brought it up, we're all tired of the pandemic, but it, it did teach us or allow us, um, trained us to leverage video technology. And I actually still spend, I would say more than half of my clinic visits are virtual. Um, and so that is a wonderful option, especially if someone geographically far away or maybe just wants to have a conversation or to understand different treatment options. Um, we can do things like review MRIs and lab results over, video. Um, I'm happy to do that, um, share records digitally. And so uh, I have definitely been a big proponent of using technology to expand 
our expertise. And, and you know, and people can still keep their local provider as well. It can be a team approach, but uh, have that kind of contact. And so I'm not trying to drum up personal business, although I am happy to see individuals, but I just <laughs> want to emphasize that wherever you are, wherever you live, um, there, uh, even if not in your neighborhood, there, I would like to think there would be a center of excellence, a specialist that somehow you could reach out to. And maybe we should all be leveraging this video technology to, to expand that expertise so that we can provide care, as you said, to these individuals living with a variety of rare diseases who may not have a specialist in their backyard. Awesome. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us. This was an incredibly insightful and informative presentation. I know that I learned a few things. Um, I hope the audience enjoyed it too. Again, oh, we have, do we have one more? Oh, someone said thank you. Um, but yes, um, if you'd like to schedule with Dr. Finn, definitely go on the Georgetown Neuroimmunology website. Um, this webinar will be available for replay. If you have suggestions or preferences for future topics, please get in touch with CSF. But Dr. Shin, thank you so much for your time. We uh, know how busy you there. are. And I'm excited to see you in person next week. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing you face to face. That'll be very Bye, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Bye-bye.